people that have not yet heard the gospel. So this morning, I uh, have an amazing time. We're going to continue our series called Reset. Uh, so it's been a great series. We're going through a book primarily right now, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Uh, it's been great just for many of us to learn what reset looks healthy in our life, what's realistic rest look like. So we'll be studying that today. I also want to take a quick minute to pray for our missionaries and Pastor Bob. But do me a favor, turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. Matthew 13, verse 13. It's quiet in here. What is this, a church? Come on, wake up, people. Matthew 13, verse 13 through 16. We'll read this, then we'll pray for missions in this morning, and uh, we'll see what God does. Matthew, Matthew 13, 13 says this. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen but never understand, and you will indeed look but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they have shut their eyes so they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. Otherwise, I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you again for your presence this morning. We thank you that you are the fire that refines us. Although difficulty can be incredibly hard, trial is incredibly troubling. Jesus, we thank you that your fire refines us, but it also comforts us. And we ask, Holy Spirit, for you to show up in a big way this morning. Lord, we pray that on a day when people are just checking into church to get home and watch a game, we say you're the main event right now. You're the one we pledge our allegiance to. And Jesus, we take a moment a holy moment to be sober and to recognize the Spirit of God. Lord, we quiet any anxiousness. We quiet any worry. And we choose to rest in your presence. And we say, Spirit of God, speak to us. Lord, we pray where we have grown callous or dull to your voice. Lord, that you'd bring acute awareness, that you bring a sensitivity to the Spirit of God. You bring a sensitivity to what you're speaking to us. Reminded the picture in Revelation where it says you walked amongst the lampstands of the churches. And you said, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, we ask this morning, what are you saying to this community? What are you saying to us right now? We want to hear the words from you, not just words that we've written down or words that we've pre-planned. Holy Spirit, speak in a significant way. God, we pray for that which we have held back from you those things that we have held close that we say, Lord, don't, don't touch that. Don't ask me to give that. I keep getting this picture of 1 Kings 18. We have Elijah before the prophets of Baal. And they're asking for God to show up in fire. And he says, pour more water on the sacrifice. The reason why that was a big deal is because they were in the middle of a drought. And he made those people offer all they had. Lord, we pray that we would offer those things in our life that we were reserved for times of need. That we've reserved and said, Lord, this is mine. No, Lord, we say all of it is yours in Jesus' name. Those things that we are white-knuckling in our life and saying, no, not this. Yes, God, we choose to offer it. We choose to say, I sacrifice everything. I will make my life a living sacrifice. Holy Spirit, do your work. We thank you that you can bring healthy conviction, that you don't operate in the spirit of condemnation. We pray for a special fear of the Lord to fall. That would stir our faith in our hearts. But right now we lift up our, our friends, our missionaries in Malaysia. In Jesus' name, have your way. Provide for them. Lord, we thank you for those nine that you've brought our way. You brought nine that needed care at the right time to run into the right person. And we pray, God, provide for them. Provide for them. Help them, Holy Spirit. Lift up their weary hands. Help their hurting hearts. We pray that you protect Pastor Bob over there, and Rick and Kemi. We pray for... Protection physically, no assault of sickness would come against him. 
Lord, we pray for miracles and signs and wonders to break out in those meetings right now. As he's praying for many that are sick, God, we ask that you would come and do what doctors cannot. As he's praying for those with inoperable diseases, God, we say, have your way and show up significantly. God, bring power. Holy Spirit, do a work within this present trip. We also pray for Pakistan and the leaders over there right now as they're preparing the way for these crusade meetings. God, we're asking, show up in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Wake up, church. Come on, we got this. It's a good day. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't worry. You won't be late for the Super Bowl. Don't worry. I know you're all thinking about it. I know. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Parenting is a complicated calling. How many agree? It's a complicated and complex calling. I had some friends that just got pregnant. They're seven months along now. They get late, pregnant in the late 30s. And see, now being on the other side, having kids that are growing now preteen age, I understand what that smile was when parents would give me gifts at that baby shower. It's this secret smile that we all know that when we give that gift to that young parent that's yet had that child in their arms, they have no idea what's about to just happen. <laughs> their life is in for a rude awakening. When this child comes into your arms and you're excited and you hold it and yet it cries and you just want it to coo at you. I know what that pain is like. You have this kid and then you get the adventure of dirty diapers and late night bottle feedings. Trying to get your kid into a car seat. I understand what that pain is like for young parents. And then finally your kid turns three. You're getting out of the tantrums of twos even though they technically go until they're four. But at three years old, you have this internal parent guilt where you know it's time to teach your kid responsibility. It's time to teach your child how to do chores and pick up after themselves. But here's the thing, we live in a complex culture where when my parents would tell me to do something back when I was growing up, there were consequences that inflicted pain upon my body if I did not carry out that task. How many know what I'm talking about? There was a clear consequence that resulted in pain. The pleasure was doing the chore, not a reward that came afterwards. But in modern day, positive parenting, I understand as an adoptive family, we had to agree to certain things where the discipline tactics that I grew up with could not be implied fully. And that made things very complicated and very hard. So trying to teach your child motivation, to do chores, to do the task at hand, all those of us try everything. This positive parenting movement, you try allowances. You try monetary compensation. Now the great currency is tablet time. How many know about this? You have to earn digital time. But there is one secret weapon that every parent has. And we feel incredibly guilty to use it. And many would deny using this. But this is the ultimate motivation tool in all parenting. When you reach that day where you are tired and exhausted, all of us know we have this special power. It's called candy. Candy is the greatest currency of motivation for a child, hands down. It does not matter the day. You know you can lead that horse to water. You cannot make it drink. You can lead that child to the chore, but yet cannot get them to do it. Candy can come into play. Now, here, here's the thing, though. Modern parenting, and I love this. This is actually to my benefit. My kids understand that candy on occasion can be used as a currency, can be used as a motivation tool. But they've only grown up with this great deception called fun-sized candy. You guys know what I'm talking about? There was nothing fun about fun size. See, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Fun size was only the thing you got on Halloween, but it, did, it was fun because you had 500 of them, not one. See, my kids only know getting one on occasion. See, we had king-size candy in my childhood. In the 80s and 90s, we loved candy. We loved sugar. 
That's just what it was. And for us, you wouldn't have like a fruit leather. We wanted our fruit by the foot in the 80s. How many know what I'm talking about? For us, it was about quantity, not quality. It's just we had this quality and this quantity that, that intersected. We, we didn't, weren't content with for a piece of bubble gum. We wanted six feet of bubble tape in the 80s and 90s. You ever do that? You ever take that bubble tape and you just shove the whole thing in your mouth? Have a big league chew, you just take it and you shove the whole thing in your mouth. You know exactly what I'm talking about. See, and if you were really smart, you understood some of the tricks of the candy shop or the snack bar at a baseball game. And see, the kids that were uneducated, they would fall prey to five red ropes for 50 cents. But every kid knew you held out for a dollar for the super red rope. That was three feet of red 40 in a long rope. And see, for us, we didn't use the empirical measuring system. We didn't use the metric system. You measured how tall a kid was next to that super red rope at three feet tall. We knew exactly what we were doing. See, we weren't shy about sugar in the 80s and 90s. There's no more overt candy than the fun dip. I mean, that was as fun as it got. When you take this sugar-laden chopstick and you dip it into blue, yellow, and red food color, and you're just literally scooping sugar in your mouth. We were not afraid of this in the 80s and 90s. Shameless sugar all the time. All the time. But here's the thing. The reason why we believed candy was okay is because candy, in this regard, was a fat-free food. I remember this. Top right corner. Fat-free food. Because you all know what I'm talking about. Remember snack wells, all these things, right? You had this food, you had candy, and, and fat was the great enemy. They believed that saturated fat was causing all this heart disease, all these things. And now what we understand is the sugar industry funded all of these studies. The fat became the great enemy in this culprit, and now sugar was a part of the American diet, unlike it had ever been before. And what they've now understood, there was a Harvard study done, is that sugar is actually the leading cause of heart disease in the country, is what it says. Over the course of a 15-year study on added sugar and heart disease, participants who took in 25% or more of their daily calories as sugar were more than twice as likely to die from heart disease. But you think to yourself, 25%, come on. That can't be real. That can't be true. They say the safe zone is being under 10% of your caloric intake is from sugar. However, as they are studying the American diet, they've come to conclude this. 200 years ago, the average American ate only two pounds of sugar a year. In 1970, we ate 123 pounds of sugar per year. Today, the average American consumes almost 152 pounds of sugar in one year. This is equal to three pounds of sugar consumed in one week. I know. And when you do the raw math and you break down the caloric intake, it's 35% of the American diet. 10% more than the 25% that causes double the heart disease. They say now that sugar, they believe, is more addictive than cocaine. We have this addiction that are making our hearts sick. Our hearts are becoming diseased because of the diet that we're intaking. And for many of us, it was unassuming. We didn't think that this diet would have traumatic health effects because it's a fat-free food. How bad could it be? And the result, we have a nation that is sick and dying. Their hearts are in rough shape. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus starts to talk to his disciples and they ask him this question. They say, Jesus, why is it that you speak in parables? It's a really cool Greek word. It's actually mysterion where we get the word mysterious. And he says, why do you speak in mysteries? Why do you speak in secrets? And this particular prophecy that he references is really quite hard for us to translate. And it's used a couple different ways in the other Gospels. And I love the way that Matthew frames it. He's writing to a primarily Jewish audience. That's what this Gospel was targeted to. 
And as he writes this, he, he houses this prophecy and frames it in a beautiful way. He says, the reason I speak in parables is this. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. They've shut their eyes so they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their hearts and then so turn. Underline that in your Bible or on your phone. I know you read on your phone. And I would heal them. Now, this word grown dull in reference to the heart is a very obscure and strange word that Matthew chooses. It's only used once here in the New Testament. However, he borrows it from the Old Testament. See, what we have is the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and then we have the New Testament written in Greek. However, there was a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And that was the common translation read at that time. And he borrows this phrase. And this word that he uses, grown dull, means this. It means to make dull, gross, to become fat and overfed. It's the reason I speak in parables. Because the hearts of this people have become sick, diseased, fat, and overfed. It literally means to become gross. And he has this direct line that many would have been able to recall from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Here's what it says. Jacob ate his fill. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, bloated and gorged. He abandoned God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. And what Matthew does is absolutely brilliant how Jesus frames this. He says, the reason why that this people, this community is so sick is because they've consumed so much culture, their hearts are diseased, and they've rejected the God of their salvation and have taken advantage of his grace. So the reason why their hearts have grown dull is because they're sick. They're so fed in culture, their hearts are now diseased. The candy of culture is so a part of their diet, they're now diseased. Their hearts have grown dull. They've gorged themselves, and they've rejected the rock of their salvation. However, if their ears were open and their eyes would see, I would let them turn and heal them. That's the invitation. And what it literally means is this. Their ears are hardened. Their ears are shut. It means their ears are angry. They have anger in their ears. And why would they have anger in their ears towards the gospel that Jesus is bringing? Because the gospel that Jesus shares is a gospel that demands change. The revelation of the Messiah was not an addition to your life. It was the Lord of your life. And his arrival and what he's confronting them in is this. Listen, you said that John the Baptist had a demon. And now I come as a glutton and a drunkard. But woe to you. For many cities would have repented at the power that was on display. The key term in Matthew 13 is turn. The gospel, the message of Jesus that comes to heal your heart and restore you demands change. But we have to ask the question, are we willing to break the addiction to culture? Are we willing to eliminate the unhealthy relationship we have with the candy of culture in our life? Because our hearts are diseased and they're sick and the spirit is calling. We have to ask, are we angry at the message that demands change? Are we shutting our eyes? It literally means averting your vision to not look at the diagnosis that's come your way. And the greatest enemy that Jesus had war with in his time was against the religious leaders of his day. And why do you think he took such an aggressive stance against religion and with the Pharisees throughout all of this? Because religion, religion is easier than repentance. See, what religion does, and it's the great enemy, I believe, 
of restoration of the heart is because religion puts a Band-Aid on your brokenness. See, what religion does is it communicates to you that culture and all these things in your life, these addictive behaviors that you know produce shame in your life, religion creates the illusion of shame alleviation. What religion does is it tells you that if you do these certain behaviors, that maybe the shame will lift, but you don't really have to change your internal life. This is the war that Jesus had regularly. He said, behold, you come here praying in public, yet you're whitewashed tombs. There's no change on the inside. You're full of dead man's bones. And for many of us in our Christianized culture, not as religious as it was in that day in that framework, but let me tell you, you're very religious. It's just different. See, we've settled for what we call sugar-coated Christianity. And for many of us, we become accustomed to go through the car wash called church. And it's really nice car wash. It's really good. They do a really good job. You all know it. Last week when the sun was out, I saw the lines at the car wash. I was in one myself. And we know this. Here's a picture. Your car gets dirty. You go through the car wash, but here's the problem. It never can fix the interior. It doesn't matter how good they are. They can't take care of the interior. And the problem with the religion we call church in many days is it's really good at fixing the outside, really bad at the inside. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can. But there's a problem. You have to invite him into the mess. And it's embarrassing. And it's awful. And it's hard. It's really tough. See, for many of us, we would say we're not religious. For many of us, we say, I'm, I'm not religious. But here's what we have to understand is the state of the present church. We've just used a different word to mask religion. And the word that church uses now to mask religion is called relevancy. See, what a lot of us have fall prey to in the modern church world is this gospel called relevance has left behind what real relationship is with Jesus. Because relevance is easier than repentance. Last night, we were talking to friends, church leaders, and they share with me, they, they watch this National Leadership Conference, very well-known church leader. And in this message to leaders about how to preach, he literally says this, it's about time the church unhitched the pulpit from the Old Testament. What? It's about time that the church left behind the Old Testament because it's too hard for people to understand. Have you read the Gospels? Have you read the teachings of Jesus? And guess what? He was the one, if I take it right in Matthew 5, that came to fulfill the law and the prophets and to not eliminate any of those words. See, we have to understand the living word of God, his spoken word that he uses in this tool here brings about change and transformation. We have to ask the real question. Are they talking about leaving things behind because they're too hard to understand or too hard to hear? Because it demands transformation of the internal life. And guess what? It will have an effect on your bottom line. It will. Culture will be at war with that message. But the remedy to religion that Jesus provides is really counterintuitive. When he declares these woes to the city in Matthew 11, he says that the power that had taken place in you would have taken place in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. This is his remedy. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. See, what we have to understand is 
religion promotes this lie that holiness is doing more. That you have to earn your sanctification and salvation. Jesus says, I paid for that. However, the outworking of sanctification and salvation is cleaning up this thing and giving it a new life. See, we have to cut relationship with sin management. And that's not what the gospel is about. That's not what resurrection life is about. The true living that Jesus promises comes from an active relationship with him, and we have to learn how to rest. See, for us, again, we're so religious in our culture, and we'll talk about cultural religion in a minute. We're so good at this that we feel we have to earn rest from the Father. The rest is earned when it's something that he bought for us. See, rest is counterintuitive in a, in a culture that we live in. But here's what's so unique, and what Matthew does here is brilliant as Jesus says this. He borrows an exact phrase, phrase from this writing called Sirach. It was a well-known book at the time in the Jewish community. And what they believed was this, is that wisdom was the interme intermediary between Yahweh and his people. And it's a very famous passage where wisdom says, come to me, draw near to me those that are heavy and burdened. And what Jesus does is it says this, I am wisdom of God in front of you. I am the wisdom and revelation of the fullness of Yahweh right here. And coming to me is the wisest thing you can do. The wisdom of relationship with me is the smartest thing you can do. The best investment that you can make. But it's not just a rest that we find on a vacation in Hawaii. It's not just a rest you find on one of those cruises where you work 50 weeks a year for two weeks off. See, it's a rest that's abiding. It's this concept of shalom. It's this peace of God that goes beyond surface understanding. It's a rest for your soul. The personhood of who you are, your interior life starts to get restored by this rest, by this shalom. And what he promises is this. He borrows a direct phrase from Exodus 34 where Yahweh promises rest to Moses. He says, I am the presence of Yahweh and that is the true rest for the people of God. True rest only comes from God's presence. But the greatest battle that we face is actually making time for his presence to take effect. It's hard. It's incredibly difficult. Why? Because we're incredibly busy. We live busy lives. And religion's easier than this repentance and restoration. But let me tell you this. Religion can't bring restoration. But you can't spell restoration without rest. You can't. It doesn't work. And the only true rest you can get is in the presence of Jesus. And I see so many people try so hard to earn those vacations. And what do you hear? I got sick. I'm more tired than when I left. Because a good kayak trip doesn't fulfill or substitute the presence of God. It can complement it, but it's not a substitute. Netflix on a weekend, and I don't care how good that pizza is alongside of it, is not a substitute for the presence of God. Can Jesus watch that movie with you? I hope so. I hope that he can. However, it is not a substitute, a replacement of the presence of God. This is not a church that's preaching no Super Bowl today. Trust me. I'm ready. I'm watching the clock. Don't you worry. There's a rest that only Jesus can provide. Only Jesus can bring. But the problem is, you got to learn to be still. You're anxious even watching me do that right now. I could tell. Like, is he going to say something? Is he going to move? Yes, I will. We have to learn to quiet. The problem is we're so afraid of the noise that comes from the soul. But let me tell you this. Jesus' presence can handle it. 
Jesus' presence can handle it. And part of the beauty of resting God is all the junk comes to the surface. You're like, I don't want to be alone with Jesus because junk comes up. Let me tell you, that junk's already there. It's just suppressed. It's already there. I can see it in your face. You hear it in your voice. You see it on your Twitter. I'll tell you that much. But we suppress these things and we get anxious because we're like, Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with these things. He's like, let me work it out. Hop on the operating table. It's toxic to your soul. Rest is only found in Jesus. And religion is just a band-aid on your brokenness. It cannot release the shame that you're carrying and cannot cure the addictions that we try to fill that vacuum of the soul that only Jesus can. He can handle. He can handle your addiction to pornography. He can handle your addiction to sexting. He can handle your addiction to whatever substance or vice fill in the blank. He's bigger than it. It was called the cross, and it's done. He dealt with it. But the problem is, we have to bring it to him. And he's even saying this, I'll meet you halfway. You just sit down, I'll show up. You don't have to create a, a journey. You invite his presence in. And he's there. This is what he says. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. See, we feel so nervous to get along with Jesus because we think, guess what? More things are going to get put on my plate. It's going to be super tiring. No, I promise you it's not. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Here's a picture of a yoke. And when we often hear yokes, we think of the yoke of an oxen. Often when you see oxen or yoke referenced in Scripture, it's the oxen yoke. And that's what Paul often uses. However, what Jesus is referring to is the yoke of a servant on the right. Is our Amish friend Phil. We'll call that Phil. So he has the yoke of a servant. Now here's the beautiful thing about a yoke the servant would have. Is their master would give them this yoke that would then carry water loads or whatever luggage loads they had on it. But here's the thing. The character and quality of the yoke determine the character and quality of your master. You had a harsh master if the yoke was hard and heavy. The yoke was splintered and rough. It showed the care of the master in that servant's relationship. It was a direct reflection of the relationship you have with that master. And what Jesus says is, my yoke, it's easy. It's kind. That's a better phrasing, actually. My yoke is kind, and my burden is smooth. I get really nervous preaching this with my millennial friends. This is not another excuse for another vacation. You have to understand, the work of the gospel brings about not heavy burdens, but greater burdens that you can bear in moving forward his kingdom. It's a responsibility and load. Guess what? Saying yes to what Jesus is asking you, though it is hard, is the easiest thing you can do. Praying for the people he's asking you to pray for is a lot harder but easier, I promise you. Ever try to pray for someone the Lord's not asking you to pray for? My goodness. See, he wants to unyoke you as Jesus shared beautifully. I only do what I see the Father doing. And what if we live that way in our life? Guess what? You have to get alone with the Father to hear what the plan is for today. A lot of us are stumbling in the dark, trying to figure things out. God says, if you just got still for a minute, I'll speak. Because he is. And I love it when you're busy as a parent and you're young. I understand Jesus is in the car ride with you. I get it. My relationship with my wife is not founded on our ability to ride in the car together. Intimacy is not created in a car ride. If I told my daughter, Farah, hey, you want to spend time today? Absolutely, Dad. We're going to go on a date, you and me. Awesome. In the car to the grocery store. What? Dad, when's our next date? We had one today. When? On our way to school. You were in the car with me. 
We had, no, it's not relationship. You have to make room in your life for relationship with Jesus. And what Jesus promises is to unyoke us from heavy burdens. And what he had to unyoke them from was the religious burdens that they carried. It was a heavy religious burden because, again, they're trying to silence the shame of a cultural life, of paganism that they've adopted. A lot of us idealize the Jewish community as being hyper-religious and worshiping Yahweh. No, they were just religious and did a lot of pagan things on the side. That's the truth. So what we do is we have religion, try to silence shame. Jesus says, let me unyoke you from that religion. Now, a basic concept here we have to understand is in Matthew 5, you'll hear it. Jesus says, you've heard it said, now I say unto you. People get really confused about that. They're saying, what is he replacing the Old Testament? No, that's not what he's speaking about. What he's doing is he's confronting the oral law that the Pharisees put on top of the original law of the Old Testament. It's called the Talmud, and what they did, it was oral, but they wrote it down in about 100, 200 B.C. Here's how many volumes is in the Talmud, the 613 commandments of the Talmud. All of that to interpret half of this. And that's what they were bearing. That's what they were carrying. And now we hear this, and we think, well, yeah, man, they were religious people. I have some news to tell you. We're religious too. It's just a different religion called the American dream. If you're religious, you don't even know it. We're really good. We're really good at living out that dream. And that dream is yoked with hurry. It's yoked with hustle. And what you'll hear is the mantras. You'll hear the secular scripture all throughout culture. And what we understand is this. Beliefs inform behavior. Beliefs inform your behaviors. They instruct your behaviors. Let's see if you've thought or heard or said some of these yourself. We're going to call these secular scripture. Give them an inch. They'll take a mile. Get her done. God helps those that help themselves. Eat, sleep, hustle. Good things happen to those who hustle. Snooze, you lose. Better late than never. Beggars can't be choosers. Enjoy it while it lasts. Money doesn't grow on trees. Where there's a will, there's a way. Guilty of this next one. If you want it done right, do it yourself. And here's a couple bonus ones. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, do whatever makes you happy. My body, my choice. And one that's getting kind of old now, what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. See, our culture believes this. If I work hard and if I hustle, I have the right to dictate what my happiness is. If I work hard and I hustle, I have the right to dictate what happiness is. And no one has a right to dictate what my happiness looks like. So we have phrases like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But here's the great deception. What happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. It gets passed on to your kids. What happens on the Internet when no one's looking doesn't stay in your history. It gets passed on to the next generation. And we are passing on addictions and behavioral practice and hiddenness. And it's time that you unyoke yourselves from the hurry and the artificial hustle. Because it's never a substitute for holiness. It just won't work. And trust me, look at Jesus, look at Paul. They worked really hard. But from a different motivation. God's inviting us into this phrase, and you say, what's the practical point of the day? Because I'm about to watch the Super Bowl and eat lots of awesome food. Yes, celebrate. Enjoy time with friends. That being said, allow the Holy Spirit to do work in you this week. And what does carving out time look like? What does intentionality with your relationship with Jesus look like? How do we learn to be still? Thank you.